Good evening, everyone. We're just going to take a moment, let everybody come into the room. We're so happy you're here with us tonight. Hello and welcome to the Faculty Spotlight event series brought to you by the Johns Hopkins University Masters of Liberal Arts Program and the Office of Advanced Academic Programs. Today's event features Dr. Earl Havens discussing Women of the Book, Unlocking the Secret Lives of Female Mystics, Miracle Workers, and Nuns from 1450 to 1800. My name is Peter Huggins, and I am the event producer. Please note, today's program will be recorded and uploaded to the AAP YouTube channel under the Master of Liberal Arts playlist. During the program, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, and we'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A portion of the event. With that, I will turn over the event to the host of our program, Dr. Tristan Cabello. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Tristan Cabello, and I'm the Associate Director of the Master of Liberal Arts here at Johns Hopkins University. Tonight is the second event of our Faculty Spotlight series, which will run during the whole spring semester. And in this series, we are trying to showcase um, the diversity of courses that you can take in the program and also the research that our faculty uh, is doing. As you know, the Master of Liberal Arts is an interdisciplinary program. You can therefore take different courses in different disciplines, such as music, literature, gender studies, sociology. And you can also take courses in history with one of our professors, my colleague, Dr. Earl Havens. Dr. Havens teaches many courses in the MLA program, um, such as, for example, the course on the history of fake news. Uh, he is the curator of rare books and manuscripts at the, at the Sheridan Library here at Johns Hopkins University. And he's also visiting associate professor for the modern languages and literature department. He received his PhD in history from Yale University and his research and teaching focus on the history of the book uh, and the material culture of texts from classical antiquity uh, to the Renaissance. Uh, Dr. Havens is going to speak for approximately 30 minutes uh, and we'll have time at the end for a Q&A session. And you can start actually asking your, your uh, question in um, the chat box here. Uh, Earl, thank you so much for joining us tonight and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tristan. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Um, and that you can all see my slideshow. Um, it's a, a great privilege to be invited to join you tonight. Um, I understand that some of the students I'm currently teaching are also present, which is a, an added delight. Um, they, they know not to trust everything I say because I do teach a course on the history of fake news from the flood to the apocalypse. But this is uh, this being Women's History Month, um, it seems especially appropriate to share some exciting news about one of the stellar collections of rare books and manuscripts at Johns Hopkins University, which um, has literally sort of developed almost out of nowhere. Um, seven years ago, six years or so ago, we acquired a small collection of about 350 rare books and manuscripts and artifacts, textual artifacts relating to the history of women religious. And when I say that, I'm really talking about nuns, uh, whether they be uh, cloistered or um, whether they're so-called tertiaries that live out in the society, but also female mystics and healers, female saints, um, uh, and as we'll even get to uh, bilocating uh, saints, female saints uh, of the Roman Catholic tradition. It's really, and since that time, we've doubled the collection. It's actually now close to 800 rare books and manuscripts, and thus is the largest and most comprehensive collection of rare books and manuscript material in the world related to the lives of women uh, in the early modern period, from about the late Middle Ages, 1450 to the uh, period of the great destruction of the conventional life during the, uh, the uh, violence of the Napoleonic campaigns throughout Europe. Um, it seems, it may seem a little odd, but it's been really difficult for scholars of the history of women and their lived experiences to access that knowledge of it, precisely because of the patriarchal nature of European, Western European and um, the broader colonial society of Europe. Um, 
but actually we can really dig into all aspects of the lives of women, particularly learned women uh, who took holy orders during this period. Interestingly, for the Protestant tradition, there is no analog. They, there were no convents. There were no female religious organizations. And so this is very much a skewed sort of Roman Catholic tradition. And yet it's a terribly rich one. And so that's what I'm going to do. In my job as a curator of rare books and manuscripts, it is my singular privilege to spend most of my life doing show and tell. Um, and there is simply no collection more exciting to do that with at Hopkins than the women of the book collection. I should also say that we'll be mounting a major exhibition of the collection in our great, great exhibition hall at the George Peabody Library, which will be up from September of 2022 to January of 2023. We're even building a nun's cell uh, in the room so that you can kind of get a sense of what it might have been like to be a, a nun uh, in those days. We'll also have an online component of that and lectures and other events around it. So keep your eyes, your ears pricked, your eyes peeled. I like to start with this image, which comes from a spectacularly rare, heavily illustrated book in the collection of which there is only one other copy in the city of Naples where the book was printed. It is a fascinating collection of scores of illustrations of women doing things both nuns as well as secular or lay women. But uh, this image is so fitting because it represents what we've had to live with for so long before a collection like the Women of the Book uh, was able to be put together. That is to say, the knowledge of the lives of, wisdom, of, of women, but not necessarily what they thought um, through texts and the preservation of knowledge produced by these women or and about these women over the centuries. But the Women of the Book Collection allows us to populate these blank, that blank slate with really interesting, deep imp cultural information, a kind of register of cultural experience that is otherwise entirely elusive. This is almost like a proto-comic book of sorts, um, though it's actually a four volume, uh, heavily illustrated uh, uh, 17th century Neapolitan book uh, that has to do with guiding women through their spiritual lives. Um, I, whenever I think of the collection Women of the Book, I think of this extraordinary portrait of one of the most extraordinary women uh, of the 17th century, Sor Juana, uh, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, who was a Mexican uh, nun who was extremely learned and, as you can see, uh, prided herself in her mastery of of the Bible, of the uh, fathers of the early church, and of uh, a kind of universal religious knowledge in the Catholic tradition. Um, this was a world, a world filled with books and with women's access to them. But um, beyond the occasional painting, we don't often see evidence of it uh, uh, preserved in the historical record. Well, when the collection, the women's book collection was built initially by a young bookseller, who realized that these books were not necessarily very expensive, that nor were they necessarily uh, collected for what they were, that is to say, this fantastic resource about women. They were largely collected by Roman Catholic universities and research universities interested in the Catholic tradition um, as a religion, but not necessarily thinking about this as a way of getting a huge uh, sort of slice through or cross section of uh, the lives of women in early modern Europe which is what we have collected it for today. This is now doubled in size and fills an entire uh, corner of the very large new library in the Evergreen Mansion at Johns Hopkins, uh, which is one of our several rare book libraries at JHU. I wrote this slide about six months ago, so all of the numbers are no longer correct. Um, that we are really increasing the size of this by leaps and bounds. It's now closer to 775 items including rare books, pamphlets, broadsides, and other forms of ephemera, as well as manuscripts and even objets d'art. So artifacts that um, uh, uh, relay the same uh, content as the, as the books themselves. Uh, though, though it reaches all the way back to the 1450s, it, by far it's, its most heavily representation is in the late 16th, early 17th centuries on to the 18th century. So it also bridges a kind of divide between the Protestant and Catholic Reformations, Renaissance, uh, and the Enlightenment. It is an extraordinary collection in that 
almost everything in it is extremely rare. In fact, one in three items in the collection are known in no other copies in the Western Hemisphere. Um, as many as a quarter are known in but one or two copies anywhere in the world. And about one in five are totally unique. These books were printed in relatively small numbers. Ironically, you might think that a lot of them were printed in Latin because of the nature of the universal language of the church, lingua franca of the Roman Catholic world of this period. But actually, the vast majority of material is published in vernacular languages and clearly oriented, not necessarily to a esoteric kind of ecclesiastical hierarchy, but rather to the wider world, including the families of a lot of these women. All of these nuns had mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, cousins, uh, and extended families. And this literature was as much produced for them as it was to inspire other young women or older women um, who wished to take on religious orders um, to do so. Now, this is a cool collection, uh, in part because it emphasizes the virtuosity of these women, particularly around the cult of female saints. During the um, during this late 16th century, there was a movement afoot to expand significantly the body of saints, and in particular female saints of the Roman Catholic Church, a desire to represent more of the diversity of the wider uh, uh, Christian or Roman Catholic world. There was also an effort to sort of fast track this effort. Um, and Teresa of Avila, who was beloved the king of Spain, Philip II, the most powerful and the richest monarch in all of Europe, uh, helped to fast track her, her process of canonization. And a lot of the literature that's produced for the women's book collections actually focused on making the case for female sanctity and ultimately for canonization within the church, um, making these women permanent saints in the host of heaven uh, whose superabundance of grace could be appealed to by those through prayer to um, benefit those on the earth. And here is Teresa of Avila, this fascinating discalced Carmelite reformer, this foundress of many convents and even male discalced Carmelite houses, uh, this great mystic, this great correspondent, this diplomat, and indeed this great musician uh, jamming out here with her mystical 12-string guitar. Um, other of these uh, fascinating women included uh, Maria de Agreda, though she never reached sainthood because of her controversy, she was blessed by the Virgin Mary, who dictated to her the Virgin Mary's own autobiography. She wrote it down dutifully, but then was forced to burn it by her confessor, her male confessor. But fortunately, she was granted by grace of the Virgin Mary a perfect memory and was able to re-record it all and preserve it for the world. She also wrote a fascinating answer to St. Augustine's City of God called the Ciudad de Dio, um, uh, which is a, a really significant theological tome of some uh, great uh, measure. She also had the capacity to bilocate from the privacy of her cell in Spain to West Texas, where she converted the Humano people, the Native American peoples of those regions, which was separately confirmed by Franciscan missionaries there. So her mystical experience was even supernatural. Uh, she, like others, could literally spiritually fly into the Amerindian lands of, the Am of Amazonia or to the Middle East where they would, other of these nuns could spiritually um, free uh, captives uh, rather than pay ransoms for them, the Roman Catholic or Christian uh, captives in uh, Saracen or, or Muslim lands, as they were called. Um, some of these women became international celebrities, including Maria Maddalena de Pazzi, of one of the great famous banking families of Florence. Here she is shown being granted the stigmata, much as St. Francis of Assisi had been in the Middle Ages. Um, this on the right is an incredibly rare description of her canonization mass, which was interestingly, we even have the medal that was struck to commemorate the event. She was uh, canonized alongside another a male saint. And uh, there's only two copies of this description of these incredible events that were convened not only at St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, but also in the Duomo in Firenze, uh, simultaneous celebrations that were in Rome were attended personally by the Pope. We have uh, also lots of books engraved, that is to say, illustrated by women 
including Isabella Piccini, who was a Franciscan nun in Venice who also engraved liturgical books. This text on the left is actually, uh, the title page is, is engraved by her. And in it, are, we, we actually um, have find preserved several holy cards, which were actually made from heavily pierced white parchment or vellum that's just pan painted and made to look like lace. Um, these kinds of wonderful accidental ephemera appear in a lot of these books because, of course, they weren't just printed. They were actually personal prayer books of individuals and essential objects in their spiritual lives. Um, we also see some printed prayer, prayer cards as well. We also have um, prayer cards engraved by Susanna Verbruchen, who was a very influential Flemish engraver who learned from members of her family. And here you see some wonderful hand-colored um, and otherwise finely engraved images of the Virgin Mary and of a, of a female saint. Uh, these books are illustrated in ways that make women like Jesus Christ. They empower women with the ability, as you can see here, to um, preach into, in, in, in the countryside and, and in the cities, uh, to even exorcise demons, as what happened with Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and uh, even to take on the imagined experience, this mystical experience of being crucified themselves. There's something so jarring about the image of a crucified nun. But here you see one who's praying while blood drips from her wounds and is being mopped up in this devotional fervor of the, of the gathered celestial crowd, as it were, including the presence of Christ and the Virgin. So these books create a sense of being in these sacred moments, of reenacting them in this sort of high theatric style. Um, these books are, these, these images in these extremely rare books are very little known uh, and highly vernacular and quite regionally different. Um, so these German Bavarian rather bloody scenes, uh, visceral scenes compare quite, quite uh, contrast quite significantly from those that you might find in Italy versus the, the fascinating um, sort of hybridization of, of pagan and animist religious traditions in, in Central America with Roman Catholic. And indeed, we have a growing selection of Latin American material in this collection. This is a hard to show you, but we even have bindings illustrating nuns. This is a fantastic um, uh, 16th century stamped binding representing St. Gertrude um, from a, um, a convent in Leuven in the Flemish Low Countries. Uh, St. Gertrude is famous, a famous abbess, who uh, there is her abbasial um, stave, and all along, along it are little rats running up and down, as is the tradition of St. Gertrude, because she was the patron saint to protect people against the plague. And here we see it in our own uh, beautifully gilt, uh, stamped um, binding. So this, this is a collection where books are not just repositories of texts, but actually artifacts that have spiritual power. And this personalization of that power uh, comes right down to bespoke bindings like this one, which is a beautiful painted uh, 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 so-called farmer's binding, uh, which contains a number of texts of Lutheran nun texts. Yes, indeed, there were Lutheran nuns early on in the uh, also, uh, small vade mecum devotional objects such as this. It's actually a micro uh, engraving and etching on silk, which has been laid down in a frame, an embroidered frame with gold and silver thread and pearls. Um, all of this dedicated to the, to, to the veneration of St. Teresa of Avila, the great scholar of the church. Um, she actually became named a doctor of the church in the 20th century. Um, we also have liturgical objects that contain either illuminations or engravings, as we have here. This is a holy water stoop that's completely woven together in wood um, with attributes of Habsburg um, and Southern German uh, uh, religious iconography. And the central scheme of the holy, uh, the uh, sacred heart uh, is the, the image of the Byzantine order, one of the new orders established after the Council of Trent, um, the Byzantine deans were um, especially devoted to, uh, to uh, healing um, 
Uh, and also the Visiting the Dean Order of Annecy in the, in the Swiss cantons was one of the richest and most powerful of all the convents of the early modern period. So uh, the Visiting Deans were sort of, you might call it a gated community of wealthy nuns in many cases. And so one could imagine having their own personal holy water stoop even in their cell. Other orders, the mendicant orders of Franciscans, it was a different story. Um, we also have tons of inscriptions, often by one nun giving a gift of a book to another, or uh, notes saying, "I have, uh, even though I am not allowed to have possessions, I have been given this book with the leave of the abbess of the convent. So there's this kind of exception that's made within the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, there's this exception made where nuns do have access to books. Because after all, knowledge and the pursuit of the life of the mind is the purpose of becoming a nun and being engaged in mysticism uh, and in uh, literary production as female members of the Corpus Christianum. We also have tons of ephemera single sheet broadsides that were printed very often as in the case with this to celebrate the um, investiture of a nun. So when you, when you entered an, a convent, you, you literally were G marrying Jesus Christ. And there would often be a profession that would start, a procession that would start either in the cathedral or in the private homes of the, of the women involved. And there would be a great procession through the streets. It was like uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day's Parade or something. And women would then proceed through the streets dressed finely, and then to enter into the convent, the doors to close, and which they would live the rest of their lives if they were a cloistered order, and their hair shorn, and their clothes taken, their secular clothes, and given the habit of their order. Um, some of these are huge. All of these are unrecorded in any other copy. They were literally printed for the occasion. Here is one, a huge one, actually, of an investiture broadside that's actually printed on yellow silk so that it could be uh, folded up and held in one's pocket and carried around uh, to commemorate the event. Ironically, it's, a, it's an event for the uh, investiture of several Franciscan poor Clare nuns who were mendicant, but uh, clearly the uh, archbishop involved uh, in the event, whose name is the most prominent uh, line, Alessandro Mattei, had fine taste, finer tastes than the Franciscans. There are also illustrated cycles and engravings of the lives of female saints. Um, and one of my favorite, this one, which, which recounts the miraculous dissection of a heart of Beata Chiara di Matafalco, an Italian nun. And they found when they dissected her heart, embedded within images embedded into her heart by God, by Christ, of the instruments of his passion. This, of course, taps into the, the ancient tradition of the dissection of animal organs in the pagan tradition to find indications and auguries of things to come, and also of uh, divine uh, benefit. Clearly, this, uh, the, the indications of these images written within the very heart of this woman are, are, are intended to represent her special sanctity uh, hidden within the secret recesses of her heart. We also have something really, really extraordinary. Nuns are, uh, this is a unique broadside issued by a cardinal of the church that actually tells you all the things that nuns are not supposed to do in their, par their parlors, is, which, is, which are gated rooms where you can interact with members of the seculum, but only through grates. That, that the cardinal had to write this long set of rules indicates that there was a lot of rule infraction to begin with. And so it's really an aspirational document, but it, it tells us a great deal um, about all of the things that are not allowed to happen and all this, the increasingly harsh schedule of sanctions that would be imposed upon nuns uh, and educande, young women in training um, held in the, or that who lived in the convents. We also have female confraternity charters. You, you know, even though women were denied access to the priesthood, lay women, secular women could join through financial donations a confraternity dedicated to various and sundry purposes. Here is one that's dedicated to the confraternity of the rope. This is a Franciscan uh, uh, confraternity. Um, essentially, the rope was the only possession that Francis had, his rope belt. And here we have in this beautifully printed on parchment document, uh, an image of the Pope, almost like John Wayne in Rawhide, steering the church, as it were, with a gigantic rope of, of, of Francis's belt. 
The charter itself lays out all the privileges in 1587 granted to this particular confraternity. And at the bottom, we see an image of the three orders of the Franciscans, the Franciscan monks, the first order, the poor clares or clarissons, the second order on the right, and then the third order of the lay confraternities of the Franciscan confraternities of the rope. Um, these are actually pre-printed and filled out um, for different groups as they adopted the rules and were given the, the charters. We also have pilgrimage um, broadsides. If you visited the Holy House of Loreto uh, in, the, in the central south part of Italy to visit the Santa Casa, literally the house of the Virgin Mary where Jesus was born, which was flown from the Holy Land to the Dalmatian coast in the Middle Ages and then subsequently flown from there to Loreto. It's the great shrine of the southern part of the church. Um, you could pay for it as a pilgrim for this imprint, which was actually donated, the, the engraving by a woman, Olympia Pamphili, um, to the Holy to Santa Casa to be impressed and sold to pilgrims to be taken away to remember their occasion. Uh, and, and as you read it, you actually end up praying for the soul of the paint patroness. We also have uh, contact relics. This is a broadside printed in blue and red sepia. And it's an indulgence for visitors to the Holy House of Loreto. What makes it super interesting is it actually has this swatch of silk, which has been laid down with, with a wax seal. That actually is a swatch cut from a veil that was placed over the head of the Holy Virgin of Loreto in the shrine at um, the, the church during Holy Week. And at the end of Holy Week, pilgrims could pay for this indulgence, which included this relic, which had touched this blessed uh, famous image of the Black Madonna in Loretta. This is an extraordinarily rare artifact and a lot of fun. A lot of these objects have powers, you see, they're indulgences. They physically are impressed with the numinous presence of God uh, and, and the indulgent powers of the church that could grant um, concessions to people including time out of purgatory for their loved ones. This is an actual copper plate, which um, we have no known copies that were printed from it, but it's actually a pocket sized. This is our reversing of the image that gives you a kind of sense of what it would look like. It's a benediction that remembers a famous benediction made by St. Francis to his simple brother, Leo, um, uh, on Mount Laverna as he was receiving the stigmata and just before he died. It was a benediction that was given to Brother Leo, granting him the protection of St. Francis for as long as he lived and for as long as he carried the benediction around with him, which he did for 40 years. The Franciscan, the, the, the um, Basilica in um, Assisi actually possesses what is believed to be um, the original manuscript benediction written by St. Francis. But this, this is a vade mecum version of that printed by the Capuchinas of Puebla in Mexico, obviously to be sold to visitors to their convent church, which includes a sovereign cure against demons, temptations, lightning, earthquakes, plagues, shipwrecks, thieves, love sickness, and labor pains. Um, so uh, this would be a hot commodity in almost any age. We also have other similar uh, artifacts with these special powers. This is a holy length Actually, it um, is based on the, uh, we believe the dimensions of the Blessed Virgin of Loreto that we we're talking about earlier. And if you wear it around your waist when you are pregnant, you will fend off the dangers of child uh, death in childbirth, the peripheral fever or complications in childbirth. So this is not just a text, it's a artifact of religious power. We also have lots and lots of engraved music. There was no way to print music. So all of these are based on engraved plates and are rare or otherwise unique settings of sacred music um, from the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. This is the earliest around 1514 canonical illustrated history of Catherine of Siena, the greatest, perhaps most famous medieval uh, uh, saint. Um, it became the standard for all other subsequent illustrated cycles of saints, female saints, in the Roman Catholic Church. We have one of only a handful of the extant copies. We also have plays. This is a, 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 an illustration from a play that was performed by the nuns in their convent, commemorating the massacre of the 11,000 Ursulines. One can only imagine how you dramatize a massacre of 11,000 nuns 
uh, on the river on the river Rhine uh, in a convent. Um, but here you'll see an illustration of it in another book in the collection. Uh, we also have slip covers, things that adapt the texts. So when the Roman Catholic Church would reform the liturgy and the women of a convent didn't quite agree with the changes, they could simply over cover them over and add their manuscript corrections in order to retain their particular privileges of use. Um, here we have one from the 1590s uh, that is actually a martyrology. Uh, in other words, it's uh, instructions on who to pray to who are martyrs of the church on various days of the week and every month of the year. Um, what's very touching is they've even added in the margins uh, obituary notices of their own nuns in their convent who have died, including here uh, the abbess, Septi uh, the abbess uh, uh, Anna, so that it, when you're praying to these saints on that particular day in the ferial calendar, you can also remember your own local abbess. Uh, one of my favorite artifacts in the collection is this extra illustrated manuscript, which is the diary of a, of a nun um, uh, who, Sister uh, Matilda, who was the keeper of the creche uh, in her convent in San Gimiano in Italy. This is a woman who could not have a family. Her family was the holy family creche that she would decorate and mount in the, um, in the, in the church uh, in the convent and that pilgrims could come and see and to venerate. This is an extraordinary record over decades of her buying new camels and commissioning new silk tunics for Jesus and Joseph and, and other things. It's an extraordinary document of material culture. Um, there, this is a, a, a document, probably this is a huge manuscript parchment illuminated what we think by students of an Ursuline nun. The Ursulines were famous educators. Uh, this one in the city of Lille, here you can see a map with the actual Ursuline convent mapped out on it. The Ursulines were the great educators, particularly of women. And this uh, broadside produced on the, the, the 25th anniversary or jubilee of this nun's uh, uh, in, investiture in her convent in Lille represents the kinds of exercises that students were taught to do, including writing emblems and anagrams. Here, her name, Isabel, um, is jumbled to make the word abile, which is the word for bees in French, and even chronograms, so that in all these red numbers at the bottom of the manuscript add up to the year 1698. So this is a uh, emblematic, chronogrammatic, and uh, anagrammatic uh, set of wordplay uh, designed to celebrate a teacher, uh, ostensibly by their students. And indeed, we have evidence that it was hung by her in her cell or somewhere publicly in the convent even, as you can see in these nail holes. And we have other engravings in the collection that show nuns in their convent cells with engravings like this or, or illustrations like this. We have investiture wedding, uh, uh, wedding licenses, as it were, that were also illuminated. We even have the matriculation book for an entire convent over a period of almost 200 years um, from its inception in 1645 in the south of Spain all the way to its dissolution in the 1830s. Each nun would come in and have their own special illustrated nuns page, as it were, with their vows and all of the signatures and counter signatures involved. We also have costume books because, of course, a nun's first to be acknowledged by her particular habit. Um, here we have one that's an accordion style version. You can tip it in your pocket. When you go to Rome, if you're confused by all the nuns walking around or, or that you see behind those grates in their churches, you can pull this out to try to identify which order they're in. Um, my last and favorite thing are book amulets. If you really wanted to protect yourself, you could commission one of these beautifully embroidered little amulets. Here is, has one with the name of Jesus on one side, the name of Mary on the other. Here is one that's printed and it's actually folded up and sealed. And if you open it, it no longer works. But we as a university are more interested in the research values, so we opened ours. And if you open it up inside or laid down by these nuns who sold these to pilgrims, all of these little holy cards, which combine to create incredible spiritual power, like to protect you like the copper plate uh, engraving of brother Leo um, from all kinds of demons and bad things that could happen to you. Even under these greater spiritual powers added with additional fold out texts 
and even special bespoke prayers written in manuscript. And then you open up in the central panel, the indulgence sheet, which actually tells you what the specific properties of the amulet are. And even within that, there's a manuscript prayer, which if you open it becomes a reliquary. All of this, I think, speaks to the power of a collection to not only document textually the secret hidden, the hidden lives of women and intellectual women in particular of the early modern period, but also open up a whole world of thinking about books as objects of power and uh, influence within society. And so we're able to preserve all of that in a single collection uh, uh, and make it available to the wider world. And so that I'll stop and hand it over to Tristan. Earl, maybe we can stop the, the presentation if you... Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Earl, for sharing all of this. That was really uh, amazing. And in many ways, it reminded me of the very reasons why I like study in history in the first place. It was about going to the archives and feeling the paper and smelling the archives, you know, and spending times and times and hours and hours in the archives, you know, looking for something. Uh, and so thank you so and, much and it for usually, that. And it usually takes you like, 10 days to find one thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And, but you can and, come to the women of the book and you can find nothing but what you're looking for yeah. if you're interested and, in women's history. Yeah, and so that that's, yeah, and that was that was just absolutely beautiful to see uh, everything that you've shared. Um, thank you. And so we have several questions here in, in the chat for you. Uh, my first question to you is, um, how do these artifacts, these books, these documents, uh, reach you guys at the Johns Hopkins Library, at the Sheridan Library, how do you find them? Well, we're very lucky. We have endowed funds and donor funds to acquire rare books and manuscripts for the libraries, especially this collection because it's used so heavily in teaching and research. Um, and uh, it was originally put together by a, an antiquarian bookseller who works for a Viennese company. Uh, and uh, since then, he's we, we've been, continued to acquire material through him because he's an expert. But then just about every major bookseller of early books and manuscripts, of which there may be 30 or 40, including several um, institutions uh, around the world, not just in the United States, they know to come to us and to quote things to us that because we are the destination for this kind of material. And that has made us really powerful, not just as a great repository, but also as a magnet for all of this. And I can add to that, we, we're even offering now research fellowships to scholars to visit Hopkins to work on it too. So that helps to augment the reputation and knowledge of about the collection. Uh, Rachel has a good question here, very interesting. Do you have specific book art conservators who work with you on the rare book collection at Hopkins? And has there been much conservation work done in the collection? Yes. Uh, we have a fantastic team of artisans uh, who are, they're just, they're not just conservatives, they're artisans, books conservators, binding conservators, papers conservators, who also happen to be absolutely in love with this collection as much as I am, because it's so diverse and so eclectic. And so the materiality is so interesting. And, and in fact, they've been making weekly visits to do an entire assessment of the collection and to treat as many of the artifacts now as possible because it's so heavily used and there's so much interest in it. Um, they've even found examples of bespoke bindings that represent uh, sort of the handicrafts that you might see a nun in a convent apply to stitching up clothes. Instead, they're stitching up uh, cloth bindings on their books. So it, they've even become kind of indications of textile practices by these women uh, in their in their convent cloisters. Um, uh, Dan here is, is thanking you for the presentation, and 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 a lot of students are thanking you for this presentation. Uh, are there any particular books not in the collection that you know of that you would love to have included? Well, I wouldn't mind the the autograph manuscript of the Ten Commandments, but. Yeah. That's Fortunately, is unavailable. It was lost uh, long ago, and until Indiana Jones discovered it, now it's in a, it's in a uh, some kind of warehouse in Area 51, I think. No, seriously, there there are so many things that could be wonderful to have. For example, autograph manuscripts by Teresa of Avila um, that we have had no luck getting kind of the actual relics, as it were, of their of their own handwriting, though. We did acquire a wonderful um, broadside issued 
in the uh, cathedral in Mexico City refusing a edict of the of the Pope uh, to venerate the Santa Teresa in their cathedral because they had the privilege of doing that, of choosing who they venerated, not the Pope. And it's it's a unique um, document that's been stamped and signed by the the authorities of the cathedral. So we have a resounding rejection of Teresa of Avila. But what we really would love is something written by the concourse of her own pen. I have a question from Carrie here. Are there any of these ancient prayer cards uh, for various protections available to read in English? Almost all of this collection is not in English. It is half of it's in Italian. A third of it is in French, uh, a quarter probably in Spanish and Flemish, and then a few in English, uh, Portuguese. And there, you know, by the time we collect, I mean, the vast majority of material is 17th and 18th centuries. So it's after the Protestant Reformation in England. And so literally all we have are things produced around women who left England who were Catholic and joined convents on the continent, particularly in Flanders and France. And we just acquired a spectacular illustrated and engraved life of uh, Maria Madalena de Pazzi, um, which is inscribed by a English monk who's in exile in Flanders to his sister, who is a nun in a convent, in, and it's inscribed in English. So that's a wonderful object that shows the kind of fraternity, the, the, the family orientation of the church. But we don't get much, unfortunately, in English. And what there is is incredibly expensive because it's so rare. A question from Michael. Uh, any writing in the collection that somewhat objectively highlights non-Christian spiritual practitioners or leaders? That's a great question. I think it's very difficult to say that there is such a thing, right? That, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that much of the material that's being written is writ written with a missionary and an evangelical purpose. But just as the Jesuits and the Franciscans, after the original period of, of the massive destruction of the written record of of the Aztecs and the Inca and others, there was an increasing interest in trying to understand and persuade native uh, peoples and indigenous peoples uh, to, to take an interest and join into the church. And we do have some really interesting Latin American things that uh, attempt to appropriate pagan or animist traditions within um, that those, for example, in Guatemala and in modern day Honduras, uh, where they're, they're, they're making these miraculous trees and things into spaces where the Virgin Mary appears and as well. And they conflate their animist traditions with those sacred trees and those sacred fountains and groves. And they're turning them into a kind of quasi Roman Catholic space. And we have one book that's about that with an indulgence sheet that actually, if you buy the book, you get uh, 50 years out of purgatory uh, with an image of this virgin of the of Ocotlan, for example, as one example. But they're, they're, they're largely missionary and non-objective in the sense that we would like them to be as scholars of, of these traditions today. One last, one last question for you, uh, Earl. Um, you know, most of our students are, of course, online, but they do come to campus uh, at least, you know, once or twice a year, uh, sometimes for the colloquium, sometimes for graduation. Um, how do we see all of this uh, at the Sheridan Library? What is the process? Can we do research on these objects uh, at the Sheridan Library? Uh, what do we have to do in order to get access to these? Well, you're, if you are a, a student at Hopkins, a uh, faculty member, you can simply create an Aon account on the Sheridan Library's website page and call up anything in the collection electronically. And uh, once you're registered as a reader, you can come in and use the materials in our reading room in the Brody Learning Commons. Um, and I'd say uh, we also have digitized 90% of the collection. So you can go onto the Internet Archive and put in the quote, women of the book in double quotation marks, Johns Hopkins, and you'll be able to access 90% of the material that way. But um, And we also have a, uh, a website that will be coming live soon through the Stern Center of the history of the book, which I direct. But the last one I'd say, Tristan, is next time we have a colloquium on campus, we could also arrange an opportunity to create a special event where we bring the materials to a room and look at them together in three dimensions rather than yeah, yeah. in Hollywood square land on Zoom. Yeah, so absolutely. look forward to that opportunity. Let's do this. Let's do this, Earl. Um, 
Earl, I just want to thank you for sharing all of this with us. Uh, we've had a lot of compliment in the chat box. Uh, students and the attendants like really love this presentation. Uh, and I can see why they love taking your courses too, because because they they I mean this presentation was extremely interesting. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, we have another event coming up uh, tomorrow um, uh, that's sponsored by the uh, Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Johns Hopkins University uh, with T. Shari White, uh, and she will talk about uh, the South is a sick place. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful night, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks, Tristan. Bye.